Hello, I'm John Fisher, and this is Ord in Israel, part two of the Ord Wingate story. Now, what's going to help this story a lot is if you make noises at home. It's an adventure story, so it needs noises. So make them at home. I can make them here, but you can join me, and I can hear you. I really can, and it feeds me. It feeds my energy. So let's try some noises. It's an adventure story, so the noises are pretty basic. We need explosions. Let's try explosions. <laughs> Good. No, that's good. That's good. I heard some good explosions. Yeah, yeah. How about machine guns? Machine guns. <coughs> good group. This is a good group. I can hear you. You're feeding me. That's great. And airplanes. Old biplanes. <coughs> Give me some biplanes. Yeah, I can, yeah, I heard biplanes. Specifically biplanes. And finally, camels. Angry camels. <laughs> Give me some angry camels. Good, good, good. Even more, even angrier. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. That's so exciting. It's got us off to a great start. So let's begin our story. We need triumphant music at the beginning of a triumphal story. Okay, so here we go. Bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum. Yeah, do it at home. Bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum. Bum ba 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 bum. Sir, I am Captain Ord Wingett of the British Army, the greatest army in the world. I was serving in the Sudan, in the Sudan Defence Force, and then I was ordered home, ordered home to England to Sheffield. This is my story. Bum ba bum. Dramatic music. Bum ba 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 bum. So, I got home to Sheffield. Here I was, back in England, in Sheffield. But it was a steel town. It was just a boring steel town. I thought this is the end of my military career in this backwater. I felt, I felt like I was in prison, like I'd been imprisoned in Sheffield and could never get out. I felt trapped there. What would my future in the army be with such a poor assignment? I was terrified that this was the end, the end for me, the end of my advancement, the end of my ambition. Fortunately, on the weekends, we had war games. War games are very simple and very exciting. Basically, one half of the British Army <coughs> fights the other half of the British Army. <coughs> and the two halves <coughs> are trying to get them right fighting <coughs> so we can take on the Germans. The war with Germany was coming. We knew it. And we had to do the war games so we'd get them right fighting <coughs> and defeat the Nazis. <coughs> so, for my weekend war game, I got my helmet. <coughs> And I got my gun. I was all set for the weekend. All set for the weekend. But I was doubly excited because that weekend we had a very famous visitor. He was a great, great man. His name was General Wabble. General Wabble was a hero of the First World War. He'd fought in Palestine. He'd fought everywhere and he'd become a great, great general. He wore a khaki campaign hat wherever he went. And he carried a riding crop. He was an impressive figure. And I knew if I got his intention, this impressive figure, that I could get advancement. I could get a promotion. But I would have to get his attention because he was surrounded by staff. There were always staff around him. But I knew how to do it because I was an ex expert in night actions, ambushing people at night, so I knew how to get at him. So I would sneak up on him at a time when he was vulnerable, in the very early morning, on the morning of the war game, when he's surrounded by his staff, but the light was very dim. And I knew how to get to General Wabble. Bum, ba, bum, suspense, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, 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 General Wow, sir! Oh, my goodness, who the devil are you? Ord Winket, sir, Captain Ord Winket. Where did you spring from, young man? From nowhere, sir. I snuck up on you. Snuck up! Huh. Goodness, so you did. What's that you've got in your hand? It's a candle school. A good old candle. A candle? Why not use a torch? Because candles 
are much more Old Testament, and that's me, Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament kind of man. Oh, I dare say well. So why don't you speak up on me, eh? Sir, I wanted your attention. I want to convince you to take me with you on your next assignment. I see your post to Palestine. I want you to take me to Palestine. I love the desert. I love the Middle East. Well, why should I take you to Palestine? What qualifications have you got? Eh? Eh? Tell me, why are you qualified to serve in my command in Palestine? Sir, I've come from Sudan, and I discovered the lost city of Zerzora. I discovered it, sir, all on my own. Have you seen the Royal Geographic Society magazine? I get it, sir. This is me, my article on discovering the lost city of Zerzura. Oh, yes, I love this magazine. I haven't seen you. Oh, oh, there you are. Oh, oh, boy, jolly good. Yes, very good. Zerzura, though, that's not a real place. Oh, yes, it is, sir. It's very much a real place, and I've been there. Really? Well, and how did you discover it? I made it my mission, sir. I wanted to go out into the desert. I love to journey into the desert. And I knew if I could get far enough out into the desert, I would find it. It's my territory, the great sand sea between Libya and Egypt. So I got permission from my commanding officer in the Sudan to leave the base and head north to 350 miles south of Cairo in the middle of the desert on a train. Make train sounds, train sounds. I got off the train 350 miles south of Cairo and got into a truck. Make truck sound. I drove 220 miles out into the desert, into the sand, to a place called Kasir Dakla. There I'd arranged for camels. Camels would take me into the desert. I loved camels. The camels are the beasts of the desert. They're the perfect desert animal because they need very little water. And they can survive out there in the middle of nowhere. That's where I wanted to go, into nowhere. But I knew that I had to wear a disguise. So I dressed like a Bedouin. And I had only Bedouin cameleers with me, 13 camels, all of us. And we headed out into the desert to find the lost city of Zerzora. That beautiful city with all those beautiful white buildings, those thousands of people, those thousands of birds flying around it. And also that sleeping king and that sleeping queen waiting for me to discover them. Also those awful, awful giants, <laughs> the ogre giants that would protect it. And also the sandstorms. I knew I could get through all that to liberate the king and queen, raise them from their sleep. So I headed off off into the desert, into the great sand sea, to discover Zerzora. Bum, ba, bum, ba, 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 bum, ba, bum, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba, bum. There I was, out in the middle of the desert, close to the sun. I felt like Lawrence of Arabia. He's a relative of mine, a cousin, Lawrence of Arabia, and I could sense that Zerzora was close. I was close to Zerzora, there was some place near, but as I approached, something started to happen. Wind started to blow, blow wind, blow wind. A fantastic wind blew up, and then I was surrounded by a sandstorm, a sandstorm all around me. It was very clean sand, of course, but it was still sand that I couldn't see. I couldn't see. It all became darkness. Nothing was visible to me. Nothing. Nothing. I was in complete darkness. And I think it was in that darkness that I walked past the city, that I missed Zerzura. But eventually, the light came back to me, and there I was in the desert. Yes, there I was. So you never actually found it. The Royal Geographic Society is incorrect. You never found Zerzura. Oh, I did, sir. I did. I found it because on that day, standing out there in the desert, I discovered a camel carcass, an ancient camel carcass and an ancient flintstone. The way they used to make fire, a flintstone, lie there in the sand. These are the remains, I was sure, of the lost city of Zerzora. Fantastic! That is fantastic! Oh, 
but they were all so I couldn't believe that story. That is wonderful, unbelievable. I love it. Love it. You are our new Lawrence of Arabia. Yes, 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 yes. You met the challenge. You took those camels out there. You discovered Zerzura, and you got written up in the Royal Geographic Society, and you discovered that Flintstone. Yes, I love you. I love you. I love it. You're coming with me to Palestine. I've decided you need to be there with me. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just a few days later, I got my orders. I was being transferred from Sheffield to Palestine. The Old Testament, the world of the Old Testament, the Holy Land. I was going. Bum, bum, bum. Now, Palestine had previously been ruled by the Turks. The Holy Land had been held by the Turks, by the Ottoman Empire, for much, much time, centuries. But the end of World War I, the Turks had lost. They'd chosen the wrong side. They sided with the Germans and they lost bad. So their empire was dismantled. It was put away. And what was going to replace it? But Eretz Israel, the state of Israel, the Zionists were going to come. You see, the British, with the Balfour Declaration, had given Israel to the Jews, back to the Jews who hadn't been there in 2,000 years. It was wonderful. And the Jews flooded into Palestine because the Nazis in 1935 in Germany had declared the Nuremberg Laws. The Nazis were going to cleanse Germany of the Jews. Many Jews emigrated to Palestine. And the British mandate was still in charge. They were still commanding in Palestine. And here came the Jews to colonize, to start a whole new civilization, building on the memory of the old. The problem was that there were many Arabs already there. And they did not like the Jews. They thought the Jews were taking their land. And they attacked, they rebelled against all that was happening, not just against the Jews, but against the British, who they saw as facilitating it. The British had promised that the Arabs could have Palestine, but they'd also given it to the Jews. So it was confusion. So the Arabs retaliated with massive attacks. Attacks, attacks, attacks. They were always attacking, 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 attacking. A pipeline, a pipeline, the Iraq Petroleum Company pipeline, which stretched from Jordan, Transjordan, all the way to Haifa. It was a British pipeline. And they used to attack all along the pipeline and blow it up, blow up sections of the pipeline so that it sprouted in the air every night where the rebels attacked. Huge geysers of flame lining the way from Transjordan to Haifa. The British were incensed. They couldn't stop this. And the British were torn. They were very torn in this period because, of course, the British had promised this land to the Jews. And many Britons felt wonderful that we were restoring to the Jewish people the Holy Land, the land of the Old Testament. But it also made a promise to the Arabs, and the two promises were in tension. When I was in London, I had met Chaim Weizmann, one of the men who was responsible for Zionism, for bringing the Jews back to the Holy Land. And he liked me. Yes, I like you, Wilgit. You are hired, a friend of the Zionists. I said, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weizmann. He said, but why? Why are you so interested in Zionism? You're not Jewish. What does it mean to you? I love the Old Testament. When I hear the Old Testament stories which were read to me by my father, my heart warms. I'm transported back to a magical place. Oh, they remind you of your father who you loved. No, I didn't love my father. I hated him. He was cruel to me, mean. He criticized me. He beat me. I, I hate my father. But every night he read to me from the Old Testament because he was a religious fanatic. He couldn't help himself. But I heard in his voice great love, great devotion. And I realized that my father had love in him, that there was a loving man buried under the hateful man. And those stories warmed my heart and became the best part of my childhood. In that way, yes, yes, I'm a Zionist and I want to help you. I want to restore the holy people to the holy land. And hopefully you will help us. So when I got there, I got in touch with the Jewish Defense Force, the Haganah, David Ben-Gurion, and Moshe Dayan. 
I was friends with them, almost from my arrival, with the endorsement of the British. The British wanted me to help because, of course, they wanted the Arab rebels to be stopped. Now, one of the problems at this time was that the Peel Commission had been sent from Britain to find out what Britain was going to do with Palestine because the British were getting sick of running Palestine. And they recommended, the Peel Commission it was called, it recommended that Palestine be partitioned. Part to the Jews, part to the Arabs. Well, this made nobody happy. Nobody. The Arabs thought that there were too many Jews coming from Germany. They were filling the land. They didn't want any Jews there. None. And the Jews wanted it all. They wanted all of Palestine. So there was tension, tension. So I went to the Haganah and I offered myself, Ord Wingate, I would help them. I would train them to fight. Well, they sent me to a kibbutz, to a settlement, a Jewish settlement called Habita. The settlements were filling the country. This one was up north, near Lebanon and Syria. And the settlement had a prefabricated fort. The fort had been sent to them by the Jewish National Fund. It arrived in the mail. A prefabricated fort. A kit. There it came. Look familiar? Yes, it was delivered to them. And this fort was built. It was designed so they could fight off the Arab rebels. It had a prefabricated wall, very easy to assemble. And above the wall was a huge tower. At the top of the tower, a spotlight. So that at night, they could look for attacking the Arabs. And the wall was double thick. And in the middle, you were supposed to put something that could resist attack. Something that was strong. Something that could absorb a lot of punishment. Absorbent and strong. And this is what they sent them. Yes, and it was valuable, so it was hoarded. These were hoarded. And they were dropped between the two walls. And they made the wall absorbent of attack and strong, strong for defense. And these forts were ready. They were ready. Gift of the Jewish National Fund. Now the kibbutz were besieged by the Arabs, always attacking, always attacking. And I told them, you can't stay in your kibbutz. You must attack. You must attack. And the best way to attack is at night, because people can't see you. Night attacks. Night attacks. <laughs> Give me explosions, explosions. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Jews were reluctant. They didn't want to follow me in my formation of the special night squads. They didn't want to fight. I told them, you've got to get out from behind your wall. You've got to not let the wall be your only means of fighting. It can't be a defensive wall. It's got to be an offensive one. Get beyond the wall. Go out and attack the Arab rebels where they are. You must. You must. And the Arabs were smuggling arms from Syria from Transjordan. They had to be stopped. Don't fight a defensive war, fight an offensive one. So I decided I would convince them through training. We would train. We trained and exercised. And I told them, you are the Maccabees. You are Gideon. You are Joshua. You are the Old Testament warriors. But I need support from the British. They supported me. But they weren't giving us money. They weren't helping us enough. So I found out that Wavell was coming to see us. He'd be driving up. So I would lay another ambush for General Wavell coming north in his campaign hat, driving up in his truck. General Wavell! General Wavell! Oh, turn, 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 turn that thing off! Turn it off! General Wavell! General Wavell, General Wavell, General, tell me, what are you doing? Who are you? It's me. It's me, sir. Me. Old Winget. And I've got a torch now. A proper torch. No longer a candle. Well, good for you, Winget. How dare you ambush me on the road? What cheek? No, not cheek, sir. No, hotspur. I've got hotspur, not cheek. What do you want, Winget? I need your support, sir. I need to convince the Jews to form the special night squads, so that we can attack, attack the Arabs before they attack us, preempt their assaults. Well, that's good. Yes, those night squads are attacking my petroleum line. Without the Iraq Petroleum Company pipeline, I can't fight a war. All right, you've got my support, my full endorsement, and I'll give you some money and some more British officers. Go to Ein Herod and launch some assaults. 
Special Knight Squad. Yes, I like the name of it. Good, really good. Thank you, sir. So I went to Ein Herod. Ein Herod. Where Gideon heard the voice of God beside the stream of Herod. That's where he heard it. What could be more New Testament, Old Testament than that? It was wonderful. And I would call my force Gideon Force. Gideon Force. So I trained the men. I trained them in what I knew to be the best way to fight night actions. First of all, you must always use a grenade. In the dark, the Arabs don't know what a grenade is. It could be a bomb. It could be artillery. It could be a bomber dropping high explosives. It could be anything. It confuses the Arabs. Then you have to use on the Arabs the bayonet. Yes, that was the ticket. The problem with the bayonet is it catches the light. Even at night, it catches the reflection of the moon. So I told the Israeli soldiers that we had to cover our bayonets with condoms. We would put condoms over the bayonets, like us. We had very big condoms in Palestine, very big, and in the British Army, of necessity. That's what we would do. There was another problem, though. There were a lot of men in the uh, special night squads who were bold, like Moish Diane. And I said, what are we going to do about your bold head, Moish? He said, what? What's the problem? The moon, the moon is reflecting off it. He said, I don't know. And I said, ah, I've got it. Moish, you must wear a condom on your head. And that's what he did. He wore a huge condom on his head to shield it from the reflections of the moon. And now we were ready. We were ready for our own night assaults. We were ready to go into action. And we chose for a major assault, the city of Deborah. Deborah, named after the first woman judge in the Old Testament. And we attacked at night. Night attacks, night attacks, explosions, explosions. We fought all night. We fought into the morning. Until the sun was fully up, we were still fighting. We set up our machine gun. The Arabs started to flee. And some of my men were very cold. So what they did was, they grabbed some Arab blankets to warm themselves, but they kept fighting. <coughs> but our machine gun couldn't tell the difference between them and the real Arabs. And I was standing very near to one of them, and our machine gun opened up. <coughs> and I was hit in several places by friendly fire. I was wounded, but we scattered the Arab rebels. <coughs> but I was badly wounded. It was a glorious event. We stopped the Arab gun runners. We stopped the Arab counterattack. We won. And General Wagle, he was so proud of me. He gave me a DSO, a Distinguished Service Order. It was presented to me at a huge ceremony, a Distinguished Service Order. And I pinned it onto my blouse with pride. I was a Distinguished Serviceman. I had received the highest award anyone I knew had ever gotten. The only thing bigger than this was the Victoria Cross. And I knew, I knew one day the Victoria Cross would be mine. I wore my medal with pride. I'd done it, I'd done it. I'd gone to the Holy Land and led the men. Success, success. And I told the men this was revenge for Saladin. Saladin defeated the Crusaders in 1187, and we have got revenge. We've revenged the Crusaders. Unfortunately, there was terrorism. Many Jews and Arabs took their aggression out on helpless people. They didn't always fight the rebels or the special night squads. They took their aggression out on civilians. 46 Arabs were killed by a Jewish bomb in the Arab market in Haifa. The next day, two Jews were stoned to death by Arabs in the Haifa railway station. A week later, Irgud killed 10 Arab civilians with the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. I swore that I would never be involved in reprisals against civilians. I didn't care if the civilians facilitated the rebels. I didn't care. That was the worst part of war, civilians, terrorism against civilians. I had my wounds, but I decided that I needed to continue with the night actions. Night actions! Night actions! 
We're always assaulting the Arab battles. <laughs> Give me machine guns, explosions. <laughs> Getting them, the gunmen. <laughs> when they assaulted us, we assaulted them back harder. <laughs> In the morning's light, always victory. I was becoming famous for my victories. But although my wounds were healing, I wasn't completely satisfied because I knew the men needed more training. They had no discipline. We'd be marching 15, 22 miles a night, but there wasn't enough discipline. In the morning, people were scattered. Machine guns were shooting us in the back. So we had to go back into training. And the thing that would give them discipline is being on time. So I started to wear a large alarm clock around my neck. And I knew that this alarm clock looked silly. I knew that. But I wanted them to know my passion. I wanted them to know the importance of time. And I realized, and I learned, that it doesn't matter if something embarrasses you if you believe in it. Nothing you believe in should be embarrassing. So I wore my clock to inspire my men. And nobody would pay for this, though. The training, they wouldn't pay for the training. The British wouldn't pay for the training. The Jewish agency wouldn't pay. But I trained them anyway. And we trained. And we trained. And we trained. And we created a new Jewish army. And finally, the Jewish agency decided it would pay. It would pay for the training. I was on the top of the world. I had the support of the British, of the Jewish agency, of the Zionists, of everyone. And then my great friend, Chaim Stoneman, the head of Unherit Kibbutz, where our wars had started, stepped on an Arab landmine and was killed. It was the first death that got to me. Up to then, it had been a game, but now it was real. I was so angry. I wanted revenge. I wanted revenge right then. And I led my SNS, my special night squads, into the Arab section of Biet Shan. And I went on a rapid through the Arab civilians. And we slashed and we burned and we burned. Responsible for killing two Arab civilians. Myself. In a fit of revenge. My own terrorism. But to the men, I lectured that it was moral punishment that was allowed. If we couldn't get the Arab rebels, we'd get the people who supported them. We'd get anybody who would take revenge. We would enact punishment. But I knew I was lying to myself because I knew that Heim Sturm and my great friend had said there is no moral punishment. There is only immoral punishment. I'd gone over the edge. I let my passions take control and I become a terrorist. The worst part of it was, was the reprisal. Terrorism is never the end. It always leads to more terrorism. And the Arabs struck back at a resort, Tiberius. They attacked it on the weekend. And they killed 19 Jews, 11 of them children. They stabbed the children. And only after they'd stabbed them did they throw their bodies into a burning synagogue. Eleven stabbed Jewish children, burned in a synagogue in flames. This was the world we lived in. Children being thrown into the flames after being stabbed. The Germans bombing Guernica to help the Spanish fascists. Soviet totalitarianism killing millions in the Ukraine, the Italians bombing with mustard gas, the Ethiopians, the Nazis on Kristallnacht, the concentration camps. This was the world we lived in, and I had been a small part of it. My guilt was overwhelming. I felt like a prophet who betrayed my people. Nevertheless, the special night squads had to keep fighting. The rebels were getting control of too much of Palestine. We had to fight back, but we would no longer fight against civilians. We would only fight against the rebels, the Arab rebels. And we launched an ambush at Lubia, targeting only rebel soldiers, Arab rebels. And a huge duel unfolded on the top of Mount Tabor. 
this huge mountain. At the top of it was the church of the Kranz Figuration. And we stormed to the top of it at night in our massive night attack. And we took our flashlight and up we went, up we went. <laughs> Give me some explosions, explosions, explosions. <laughs> and the only light was the glow of the moon over our heads as we fought in the Church of the Transfiguration at the top of Mount Tabor. And we could win. <laughs> we could win. So I signaled for the Royal Air Force, the RAF, to come in and support us. I'd learned from reading treatises written by Luftwaffe generals about infantry receiving support from aircraft. And in they came, the Royal Air Force. <laughs> make, 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 make airplane sounds. Make airplane sounds. <laughs> And in the morning, we'd sent the Arabs packing. <clears throat> we defeated them unequivocally at Mount Tabor. It was a clean fight, no civilians. And we learned to use aircraft. Wavell always gave me wonderful support. And he decided it was time for me to have home leave. He wanted me to go home, back to London. So I got on a ship and journeyed home. Make ship sounds. Back in London, I wasn't interested in relaxing. I was concerned. I was concerned because of appeasement. The Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain was appeasing everyone, all the fascists. At Munich, he gave Czechoslovakia to Hitler. He had given Ethiopia to the Italians, taken away from the Ethiopians and given it to the Italians. He was appeasing everyone. And I hated appeasement because I knew the next step would be the abandonment of Palestine, that the Jews would not be allowed to make their land there, to create their own state, a new Old Testament. They wouldn't be allowed. So I went to see Malcolm McDonald, the colonial secretary, I said, Mr. Secretary, Sir Malcolm, please listen to me. The Jews can bring so much to Palestine. They grow things. They build cities, communities. It's a growing culture. They're wonderful the Zionists. They'll bring back the Old Testament if we let them. Don't deny them. So Malcolm said, I'm sorry. I just don't agree with you. It's become too much of a burden for Great Britain. We have a big war coming. We need to think about more important things. What could be more important? So the War Department told me to shut up. I've been ordered to shut my mouth. And I said, well, I will shut it as noisily as I can. So I went to see Winston Churchill, Sir Winston, who I knew one day soon would be Prime Minister. He wasn't yet, but I knew he had the power. And if he was in office, he could make it happen. He could make the state of Israel happened. So I went to see him at a cocktail party. I said, so Winston, may I speak to you? He said, mm, Mary, young man, what, what would you like to say to me, young man? Well, so Winston, it's about Palestine. I've been serving in Palestine. The Zionists are wonderful. We can't betray them. We've told them that we give them a state. We can't take it away from them. Wonderful things are happening there, sir. They have passion, they have drive, they build, they grow. We must give them something, some kind of state in Palestine. And then this man walked up and he said, Oh, Winston, it's so good to see you. How are you, Winston? Am I interrupting? And Winston did a slow burn turn. There, sir, this young man is telling me something very important. Please do me the courtesy of shutting your trap, sir. It was a glorious moment because I had Winston in my corner. I went back to Palestine and while I was there and he'd written up my report. My report, the report on me as a captain. 
And what it said was, he's a good officer, an excellent officer, motivated, hard fighting, hard working, but he seems to be motivated more by ambition. I said, no, sir, no, I'm motivated by duty, duty to what we said we do, to bring a state to the Jews. Well, he didn't agree with me. And I was losing my best ally. On top of that, the special night squads had started going to extremes. In a mission that I didn't lead, they took three captured Arabs, tied them up, and shot them in the back of the head in cold blood. The British officers were beginning to tell me that the SNS, the special night squads, had forfeited our reputation for fair fighting. And then, in May of 1939, I was ordered home. I was ordered back to London to command an anti-aircraft unit, which was important work. I don't deny it. I, I, I realise it was important work. You see, bombing had become the thing. Everybody was bombing. Hitler bombed Guernica to help the Spanish fascists. The Italians trapped mustard gas on the Ethiopians. The Japanese did the same thing in Shanghai, in Guangzhou, conquering the Chinese. There was a great fear in England of bombing, and anti-aircraft units were very, very important, but I didn't care. I didn't care. I didn't care. I didn't want to man an anti-aircraft unit. I didn't give a damn about my DSO. So I went to the Haganah and I said, listen, if I can't come back here and fight as a regular soldier, I will come back here and fight with you as a refugee. I believe I am a Zionist too. And then Sir Malcolm, the colonial secretary, issued his white paper. This is what he advised the British government to do and what the British government would do with regards to Palestine. 15,000 Jews would be allowed to emigrate there for the next five years. No more Arab land could be sold to the Jews. There would be no Jewish army, none, because it provoked the Arabs, and there'd be no partition of Palestine. It would be one state after five years with a two-thirds Arab majority. Oil. The British had opted for oil. They denied their obligation and said no. We have to go with oil because a war is coming. I was outraged, furious. I got drunk at a party. And I said, we must, we must declare war on the British. Yes, yes, we must go to Haifa and blow up the British oil refinery. Yes, this is what we must do. Come on, let's do it, let's do it tonight. But my friends in Haganah convinced me that they couldn't turn on the, on the British. The British were the only friends they had, and the British were going to fight Hitler, and Hitler was the enemy. Yes, the British weren't helping them, but the British were the only thing between them and Hitler. Even he could get to Palestine with his tanks if the British couldn't stop him. They told me to calm down and to go home and to man my anti-aircraft unit. And I did. And eventually, I was called forth to lead more night attacks in the Sudan, helping the emperor liberate Ethiopia, Ethiopia for the Ethiopians. But my heart was always with the Zionists, and I will always consider myself a Zionist. And my greatest tribute was when Moshe Dayan, that great Jewish general said, Ord Wingate taught us everything we know about fighting. Thank you for joining me for Ord in Israel, part two of the Ord Wingate story. The story concludes next week with Ord in Burma. That's where he went after the Sudan. Thank you for joining me. This was a Theodore Rhinoceros production of an Essential Services Project. Thank you so much for being here, and good night.